This is a uh, you know, pretty amazing uh, turnout, and we have people here from all over the country and all over the world. We have uh, some friends from London here. We have our, many of our, have, we have a import, great importer in Robertson Wines in, in London, and uh, they represent a lot of the uh, beer members, and we thank uh, everyone from London to be here, and of course, from, we have a lot of people from Ohio, we have uh, people from uh, Argentina, Laura Catena is here. <laughs> oh, Japan, okay, wow, there we go. We have every, this is a, a pretty amazing turnout, so. Um, anyway, we're gonna start with uh, John Bonnet, I've been John Bonnet from the Chronicle here, and moving on to New York for Punch. Uh, Senior contributing editor. Editor. Okay, so that's that's big move, and uh, of course a huge supporter of IPOB and the book New California, which uh, you know really kind of opened up what California has been doing, and hopefully will continue to do. So it's very exciting to have John here to uh, give the keynote speech. Raj, thanks um, to you and, and Jasmine and everyone at IPOB for. Uh, for having me, uh, and, and really for, I realize this is uh, the fifth year, I think, which is amazing. Um, and is a good time for me to talk about what I want to talk about today, uh, and, and probably uh, a good audience as well. Uh, it goes without saying, obviously, that for uh, the past several years, we've, we've been witnessing this inflection point in California wine. Uh, you could peg it to, say, 2011, uh, when uh, uh, five years ago uh, IPOB was founded. Uh, you go earlier, the year before that, um, I actually wrote uh, sort of what would become the New California Wine, which was an article called The New California Wine, uh, based on the seeds of what I could see were, um, were growing into um, a major change. Um, but earlier than that, 2008, 2009, uh, we're seeing all these, uh, these growing data points showing that uh, that winemakers in California, wine growers, uh, and, and ultimately, uh, at that point early on the curve, consumers, uh, were looking for something different. Um, and again, if you go back even farther, 2005, 2006, uh, when honestly a lot of the wines uh, that uh, we have before us and a lot of the wines you'll taste today, um, were emerging into the style that they now have, where people were uh, deciding that they felt that, um, that there was an expression they wanted to show in California that um, had been uh, underrepresented. I was going to say suppressed, but underrepresented. Um, there were a lot of winemakers who were simply fed up with, with what they felt were uh, market, or more specifically critical pressures um, to make wine in a style that they may not have loved, um, along with, frankly, uh, some winemakers um, who are in this room um, who uh, who always believed that and, and took their lumps for it. Um, I was talking with Jim Clendenin uh, earlier, who will uh, gladly tell you of the many years when um, him wanting to maintain consistency uh, was a liability. So um, it's been this kind of glorious half decade or so of what I'll call rediscovery in California. Um, we haven't lost sort of the ocean of cheap bad wine, we never will. We haven't lost the overwrought trophies, probably never will. Uh, but the narrative has shifted. Um, IPOB has uh, helped do that in an enormous way. Uh, a lot of other things have. Um, and quite simply, uh, I would say we're, we're now fully emerged into a new golden era for California wine. Uh, and it's one that I think is as important, and I've said this now for about 15, 16 months, uh, it's as important as what happened in the 70s uh, after the judgment of Paris in 76. Uh, made very clear to everyone that California uh, was uh, going to be one of the best wine regions in the world. Uh, so, great. Um, but uh, with success comes a certain level of responsibility. Um, and I think there's, there are cautionary tales to be taken from what happened um, the last time around, 40 years ago essentially, uh, where you had this great wine revolution of the 70s and then over the following 20 years, uh, the industry struggled with expansion. It made uh, a lot of strange stylistic decisions. Uh, it uh, ultimately kind of grew faster than it could control. Um, and I think the, the need for responsibility is, is doubly important here in California uh, because we're, we're on the edge of the Western world. We're, we're literally the frontier um, and, and always have been. 
uh, and that has created a, a drive to innovate, not just in wine, but in everything. Um, but it also can comes at the risk of an insularity uh, and of not watching what the rest of the world is doing. And honestly, I think where California wine had gone off the rails for a while was by not paying attention. Um, so I started wondering about a year ago, um, having seen that, that things were in fact changing in a big way here, what's California's next move? How does the wine community here uh, take all of this great progress uh, and, and push it forward? Um, so I want to, to kind of go over uh, what I see at least are some of the challenges uh, that lie ahead because I think it's better to, uh, to address them and to look at them uh, and to start thinking about the answers uh, rather than um, sort of take all this momentum and then watch it go off a cliff. Uh, so uh, I'm, the way I want to describe this is, is as a series of concentric circles. Um, uh, we'll start with the outermost circle, we'll move to the middle. Um, not that these, you know, what, what I'll call the outer rim, uh, aren't really important issues, but they're not necessarily issues that are going to solely affect California. Um, I think they're more symptomatic of some of uh, the core concerns that are out there. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through them a little bit more quickly. Um, mostly because I think there's just, there are things that are in progress and that need some work and some attention. Uh, the first one being that, uh, that we still have a lot of work left to do in making Appalachians here mean something. Um, Appalachians are historically a way of defining a canon, of, of saying these are places that we know that have a, uh, established for themselves a sense of accomplishment. Um, and, you know, much as Bordeaux has tried, um, they are not culturally a marketing ploy, they um, certainly have become it. Uh, California sort of went right into this mode, uh, and really the entire United States because of the way the system was set up, um, of abusing Appalachians for commerce. Uh, and um, quite simply, we need to, to go back to finding a real cultural value in putting a place on a bottle uh, because otherwise, um, otherwise it's just a cheap trick. Um, it almost seems redundant to say in this room, but uh, there's still, I think, a lot of progress to do in getting winemakers back into the vineyard. Um, I would say pretty much everyone who, um, who uh, shows their wine at IPOB has, um, has worked very hard to do that. Um, but overall, California still is struggling with an estate model and, and probably will never get it. Uh, land here is too expensive, uh, opportunity cost is too high. Um, but we have to get past this, this schism that, that California, frankly, has rewarded, not just in the modern era, but going all the way back to the 19th century, where you have vignerons, to steal a French term, um, on one side. Um, uh, actually, no. I, let me say winemakers on one side, farmers on the other. Uh, and the notion of the vigneron, uh, really kind of somewhat alien, where you would have a farmer who, um, who was creating an agricultural product from his or her own land. Um, I think if you ask any of the winemakers here today, um, they, would, they would agree that the greatest wines will always come from vintners who live as close to the land as they can. Um, it's, again, uh, a thing that by no means is an issue in California alone, um, but I think um, we still need to talk probably a little more seriously, and it's, it's one of the pieces that I, I regret that I never did, although I felt like um, other people could probably do it better, um, that there is still a gender gap in the cellar. Um, there are terrific, amazing female winemakers in California, um, but, but frankly, there aren't enough. Um, and there aren't enough who are able to uh, own their own labels, uh, produce their own wine, who don't end up having to, to take corporate jobs for one of uh, many, many reasons, uh, not the least of which is that running a small wine business in California um, is extraordinarily hard. Um, but at the same time, if you look uh, to other regions of the world, you can see that um, we have a little more progress. I mean, if you look at Beaujolais and people like Niva Darn and, and Sophie Dubois, who have been there maybe five years, um, but are really sort of already making interesting, compelling lines, um, there is progress, and, and I, think, um, I think that it's a difficult conversation, and again, one I'm not the best person to, 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 to guide, but worth uh, focusing on. Uh, and the last thing in the, in the outer rim is, uh, again, really paying attention to making sustainability matter, and, and California um, has made big strides on this, it should have made big strides on this, considering how environmentally conscious we are as a culture here. Um, but there's still this tension between uh, philosophical sustainability and commercial sustainability. Uh, and if you look where we stand on irrigation, on nursery clones, on the use of Roundup, which uh, is still 
astonishingly pervasive uh, in this state. Um, there are way too many sort of quote unquote sustainable practices that are, that are frankly designed to end run a key consideration. And again, this is, um, this is a, the right but also uh, not the ideal audience because again, the winemakers uh, whose wines are here today uh, have focused so hard um, that uh, sustainability in California is something that uh, deals with everything but farming on a human scale. And uh, if you look at most of the sort of official uh, ways that it is, um, it is endorsed, uh, it doesn't deal with the matter uh, that at some point um, when, you, when you farm too much land, uh, you can't pay the same amount of attention. So uh, that's the outer rim, so to speak. Uh, let's draw one circle closer in. Um, like I said, so far, these were all sort of symptomatic. Um, the next set of, of things I want to talk about are, I think, issues that go closer to the heart of, of how we define California uh, wine culture. Um, the first thing is, uh, and I've really tried to stick to this and, and will continue to, um, is we have to stop talking about California wine in European terms. Uh, we have to retire the word Burgundian, apologies to those of you who, uh, who are still fond of it, um, and, and all the sort of related terms, I mean, it could be meritage, it could be sort of, uh, Calatel is a little tricky, someone was talking about um, Italifornian the other day, which I like. Um, <laughs> but, you know, all, all of these had their place when we were struggling for a reference point. You know, James Zellerbach was building Hanzel, uh, to the greater glory of Claude Rougeau in the 1950s, it made sense to, to, to talk about sort of the, the inspiration, the reference points. Um, but today we need to talk about uh, California's greatness, and I think that's frankly the entire purpose of uh, IPOB, and, and one reason that, uh, that I think the, the focus on California wine specifically, and obviously Pinot Noir and Chardonnay has been valuable, uh, because I think one of the biggest falsehoods, uh, one of the nastiest untruths about the new California wine, if you will, is that it's an attempt to make California wine into European wine. Uh, California wine could be new, could be new, could be old. Um, is about California. It's about abundance. It's about sun. It's about the specificity of place. Um, and I would take that a step further and say I think it's disingenuous to make sun, to make California, to make this uh, this abundance an excuse for what we were seeing 10 years ago, which was a lot of low acid, 15%, not terribly interesting Pinot Noir that was being made under the defense that that was what California gave. Uh, I think it's an equally cheap shot, frankly, to say that, uh, that the moderate wines in California, again, most of which, uh, uh, many of which will be on display today, uh, are copying Europe. I think that's an affront to the winemakers here, uh, and not just here in the room, but in California. Uh, to say that they're simply trying to ape European wine. They are really devoting their lives, as many, many people in the room are, even if you're not making wine, if you're selling California wine, if you're buying it, um, they have devoted their lives to expressing California, and I think it's important to respect that, uh, and to respect the fact that you can make a moderate wine that is very, very Californian. The next thing, um, this is something that's come up sort of tangentially at IPOB occasionally. And I wanted to finally, um, I won't say we'll resolve it, but, um, but I think to be a little candid about it, um, that all interventions are not created equal in the, in the winery. Um, how many of you saw, there was an item not too long ago in the drinks business that um, asserted that one quarter of all premium Pinot Noir and Chardonnay undergoes spinning cone treatment? Anyone? All right, well, my Twitter feed at least was reading it. Um, so I honestly was shocked that anyone was shocked because it's sort of this, this known thing in California that you know an enormous quantity of even relatively expensive wines undergo very intrusive and invasive uh, winemaking processes. Um, and so of course, you know, what happened there was what happened, I think, four or five years ago at IPOB was uh, the moment you start talking about adding acid, about spinning cone, anything, um, the apologists sort of pop up the usual canard about burgundy and chapelization and how uh, all the winemakers in France are just throwing sugar in their wine. Um, again, you know, this, this came up in, in a varied form, I think a couple times, uh, not on this stage, but on other IPOB stages. And all I can say is it's ridiculous. It's a false equivalency. Um, I'm not saying that there should be no intervention. Uh, it's not a natural wine convention. 
Um, you know, winemaking by definition is an intervention, the sulfur is an intervention, um, it's part of the process, but to, to take a farmer with a bag of sugar and equate it to a multi-million dollar chemical process that, that's fundamentally attempting to change the constituency of wine is, like I said, is ridiculous. Um, that's not to excuse the farmer with the bag of sugar, uh, that's not to excuse, uh, you know, a mild acid addition or even, you know, if you, if you look in, um, in Germany in 2010, um, which was this bizarre year where the extracts were so high and the sugars were so high and the acids were so high that winemakers had to deacidify, um, not typically an issue here, um, although occasionally. Uh, you look at how much it pained really good winemakers there to undergo what really was a, a very mild um, intervention that frankly dated back 100, 150 years. Um, and you see that, uh, you see that it's, um, it's a matter of intent and it's frankly a matter of, um, of making a rational uh, business choice in order to make your wine saleable versus what I would say is the, a very deliberate, cynical uh, intervention that, that, um, that frankly I think became uh, became prevalent because of what I'll call certain critics' gestalt. Um, and uh, we don't tend to talk a ton about intervention. Um, there are many, many times that I sort of was talking with a winemaker about a wine and wished afterwards that I'd asked sort of that series of super awkward questions about what acid went in, what water went in. Um, so again, you know, th these things are all a matter of, of life, uh, and certainly in California, but we've, we've avoided talking about them, we've avoided talking about um, the, the scale of intervention, and I think we have to. Um, and one other thing before we get to the inner core uh, of, of, for me, what, what is uh, the next important thing in California, which is um, we have to repair what ripeness means. Uh, what do I mean by that? Mostly for, for really the first time, uh, pretty much anywhere, and, and this isn't just California, uh, modern, kit, uh, modern viticulture has offered the opportunity uh, to provide a ripe vintage nearly every year, having just gone through the 2011s, um, some winemakers might dissent, but, um, but in general, uh, viticulture now is, is really more advanced and better than it's ever been. Um, and for me, what, what's the implication of that? Um, is that this, this pursuit uh, of ripeness is all, which made sense in a world in which you struggled to actually get a 12%, 12.5% wine, um, it, it simply has to be at its logical end. That knowing that most years um, a, a decent farmer can, uh, can fundamentally ripen uh, his or her grapes, um, you have to then start making reasonable decisions uh, about the moment that's appropriate to pick. Uh, that means, among other things, that um, in, in our discussions, again, could be winemakers, could be trade, we have to stop talking about picking early. And this, is, this is something that honestly came up even a few days ago where I was listening to someone describe how they made a decision to pick on the early side as though picking at, at you know, dramatic levels of ripeness was somehow historically normal. Uh, again, this is, um, you know, in a world, in a world, in a world, uh, where uh, where you're you're worried about getting ripeness enough to make a decent wine, um, it's one thing to um, to sort of push to the last moment and to um, to you know to quote unquote pick early if you want to not quite go there. But that's just not the world we live in anymore. Um, and I think again, um, it goes back to this notion of intervention, which is um, you have to ask not simply what's ripe, but how ripe can you be without then having to go and repair the effects of that ripeness in the cellar. Uh, because when you start repairing, then you start stepping away from terroir. And that uh, ultimately is what leads us down a path to not being able to pursue greatness. Uh, which then brings me to what I'll say is the core uh, of this circle. Um, and at the risk of drawing uh, a bit of fire from my hosts, uh, at IPOB today, uh, I will posit this. Um, building, a, uh, building a great wine culture for California uh, is not actually about balance, it's about intent. Um, and what do I mean by that? Uh, for me, at least, and then we've been, we've all, I think, been struggling with this notion of what balance means um, 
in, uh, in the course of coming to a, uh, an event called In Pursuit of Balance. Um, I mean that balance, which could be chemical, could be viticultural, could be aesthetic, uh, is a vehicle. Um, it should not fundamentally be a goal in itself, if not really a goal. Um, it moves you down the board. It lets you start asking interesting questions. And I think um, if, you, if you look at the wines that are here today, um, if you, um, you know, when we sit down to do the wine tasting to choose uh, members of IPOB, uh, balance simply allows us uh, to, to see what's possible. Um, and so for me, where we are in California now, where we're, where we're finally getting to is a point where the wines are letting us see what's actually possible. Uh, and for me, that's, that's, that's all of it. That's the, the great maturing of California's wine culture. Uh, and that gives us uh, the path to the future. So um, having just said that, what do I actually mean by intent? Um, there are two aspects that I want to talk about. One is really easy, uh, which is being delicious. Um, it's what makes wine a pleasure. It's why we all keep drinking it in part. Um, the other part is more complicated, and that is uh, that a great wine needs to be culturally significant. That's what makes a great wine great. That's why wine has had this hallowed role through the centuries um, that's made it this, this nobler pursuit than, than, than other things. Um, it's, I would argue it's why we're all here today, um, except for, you know, unless, unless you thought you could skip out of the office and like, go drink Pinot Noir in the morning. But, um, but we, you know, we all keep coming back to things like this because we think there's a larger meaning to these wines than simply the fact that um, they're, they're yummy. Uh, and frankly, it's why making kind of a, you know, a yummy generic wine uh, will never be enough to be, uh, either for it to be a great wine uh, or for um, California or anywhere to create a great wine culture. And now the bell tolls. Um, and it's frankly also why uh, the excesses of California in the late 90s and early 2000s were this enormous source of frustration to me and another, uh, a number of other folks. Um, it is why, um, you know, cultural significance is why, say, Musini could be Hill of Grace, could be Canubi, Mount Eden, Montebello, Pickham. Um, they're not simply admired. Uh, they are, frankly, cultural beacons. They're places that um, have to be preserved, have to be um, put on a long timeline. Um, they represent, quite simply, the historical application of culture to agriculture. Uh, and it's why, again, delicious, uh, with apologies to some of my fellow critics, simply will never be enough on its own. Um, so this brings me uh, to uh, a place that I tend to go fairly often, which is uh, what I define um, as the lines of big flavor, um, which in part got us uh, on this road to, uh, to the pursuit of balance. Um, but it's not that they necessarily lack balance, although I felt they lacked balance. Um, it's that to me they, they failed on either one or both parts of this equation of intent. Um, many of them, at least for me, weren't delicious. Uh, obviously, others, uh, other dis others disagreed. Um, it's more that I felt that their way they had no cultural value uh, aside from the desire to be important. Uh, and more than that, they, they made this crucial mistake. Uh, they equated being important uh, with being self-important. Uh, or excuse me, they equated being important with, uh, uh, with being culturally significant. Um, and again, they were often self-important, um, but they saw um, the chase of importance, uh, meaning getting on the cover of a magazine, says the news journalist, getting on the cover of a magazine, <laughs> getting 98 points, whatever it is, uh, you know, making these incredibly ripe, flashy wines off of four-year-old vineyards. They equated, they equated that sort of self-importance, that, that sense of uh, self-appointed accomplishment uh, with being significant. Um, it almost goes without saying, significance is something that takes decades, it takes centuries, um, even more with vineyards than with wineries. Gavin Shannon was talking about this today, I think in terms of the original blocks of Chardonnay uh, that basically were being ignored, um, and that gave him an opportunity to really see uh, and to show what they could do. Um, great vineyards have to endure great vintages uh, and lean ones. Um, they have to always show their quality they have to always show their distinction, even in a poor interpretation, even when someone makes uh, a bad decision and I guess, you know, doesn't pick early. Um, but, you know, you see when vineyards are made by people who are not necessarily the best interpreters, um, great vineyards show themselves. And that's why 
take Hirsch, you could take Duluth, say, in Anderson Valley, Sanford and Benedict, Isley, Tokelon, to throw some Cabernet into the mix. Um, they've all demonstrated their quality and their distinction and their signature through the decades um, and through a variety of, of winemakers and interpretations. And so ultimately, um, this is where we have to go in California. We have to start asking, I think, somewhat harder questions than we have uh, about what really is culturally significant here. Um, which wines have the greatest potential and have demonstrated it on the, you know, in the long term? Which vineyards have uh, true potential uh, versus simply making a good and quick showing? Um, not, not which ones have sort of pushed their way to the head of the line to be important, uh, but the ones that, that gracefully demonstrate their greatness year in and year out on a long time frame. Um, and that, to me, ultimately is why IPOB matters, it's why this evolution of style matters, um, it's why the greater purpose of an organization like IPOB isn't just to, to get a bunch of like-minded people together in a room uh, and talk about wines we really like. It's to keep probing at these things because these are going to be essential in continuing to prove how great California can be. It's why it's not, uh, despite what a lot of people might think, it's not a jihad for lower alcohol. It's not a jihad for Europhilism. Um, it's why balance has sort of become this, this, uh, this laden term uh, that I think it uh, got unfairly uh, sideswiped. Um, I would argue that, that IPOB um, and the sense of proportion, um, that's what I saw in, in what I've sort of defined as the new California, even if it also included the old California, more than anything have given us really useful tools to, to start asking the super important questions. Um, they've allowed us to start pushing forward the wine culture in a meaningful way. And so again, as I said at the start, um, now is the moment to make the next move. That could be winemakers, critics, trade, buyers, sommeliers. I think all of us have to work a little bit harder to elevate uh, our communal dialogue about what in California wine is meaningful. Uh, and that, more than anything, is the way we start defining a wine culture that is ours to define. Thank you. Thank you, John, for, for uh, describing and, and, and way of defining what IPOB means, because the name is you know, in pursuit of balance. Of course, we, you know, we don't know what balance is, because very much like natural wine, it's balanced wine. What does that mean? It means whatever it is to everybody else. So, so John, thank you for you know, talking about what this is, because it's not I mean, a competition. It's not who's, who's making better or worse. It's about defining what we do with individuals who are part of this, this group. So thank you very much for listening. This is very uh, humbling to have everyone here because uh, when me and Jasmine had our first event in five years ago, we had a tiny room and I remember Jim Clement speaking for most of the, of the seminar, which was awesome. But you know, we don't know what we were talking about because we were just trying to figure it out. And now we want to figure it out just a little bit, not enough to say this is a you know, people call it a movement. I, I don't, Jasmine doesn't, because it's not. It's just a, it's a group who tries to push each other and try to you know, figure out what they're doing. And that's exactly the word, that's in pursuit. And I know it's a terrible name, but uh, it's really <laughs> so that's, that's what it is. You, you get your decoder ring. What's that? You get your decoder ring. Yeah, there we go. So anyway, so I, I'm humbled to have everyone here. This is really an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary turnout. And, Everyone, and I must thank all the sommeliers here who helped turn the room. And uh, yeah, Ted Lennon, uh, Dan Cutman, who uh, you know, did the whole turnaround. Great champions here early morning. So thank you guys. Uh, and I'm going to now introduce uh, my good friend Jordan McKay. If he's here for the next hour. Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Jordan got my. So we decided to do something different this year. Uh, we decided to have a we have stand-up comedy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this guy here, you know, uh, Saint Vincent, uh, David Lynch, funniest guy I know. Hang on, he's not the funniest guy. The funniest guy I know is that guy, there, Jim Knight, all the way from Los Angeles. So I think it should be a very, very fun, uh, fun seminar here. And, you know, we always talk about uh, IPOB and about balance and all those things. So. 
this year we have something different. We have uh, uh, a few other wines from friends and it uh, should be a very interesting debate. Uh, and I'm sure that Jordan will crack a joke or two. And uh, if, if you know, yeah, well, you know, we'll see. But uh, Jordan McKay, I guess everyone you know who Jordan McKay is. Uh, Jordan McKay uh, written a bunch of books and, uh, and uh, you know, writes about wine and spirits and beer. And his latest book, Franklin's Barbecue, if, uh, if you haven't uh, got a hold of that, it's pretty, uh, you know, if you want to wait in line for two hours uh, for, for barbecue and make it a snow. Four hours, four hours. Okay, Jordan, you're up. It's awkward. So a man walks into a bar. <laughs> he asks for a glass of Pinot Noir and two shots of vodka. Can't hear you. The tape on your face is off too. <laughs> Jordan, just tap it right there. It's that beer. Happy birthday. Thank you, likewise. Take you anywhere, aren't you? <laughs> doing, doing Pinot shots. Takes a lot in this practice. Sh shouldn't your brother be here? What? Shouldn't your brother be here? He, uh, no. <laughs> Definitely not. He just embarrassed us all. So. Check. <laughs> All right, man. Okay, we are live. My okay. check. Remember when David Silver did that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, you're just working. I'm loud. Um, All right, everyone. Uh, Raj, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, Jasmine, thank you so much for all of your incredibly hard work and your organization and your diligence for putting all this together again. It's really. <laughs> Um, second, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, after the tasting, if you would remember to dump your glasses and push in your chairs, and then the organizers would also like to invite you two floors down to a special sneak preview screening of The Avengers Part 3, <laughs> in pursuit of Alamont. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. That's awesome. Um, okay, it's going to go that way. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going, since this is possibly the last that I'll really be able to speak on this panel, um, I'm just going to uh, have a statement here at the beginning before I introduce the panelists. Um, you know, I think out, uh, if you have conversations out there in the larger world of wine, um, one of the things I hear a lot about is grousing about in pursuit of balance uh, for whatever reason. That there's, there's a lot of opinions floating upon, around this not a movement, this group, um, and, you know, I think that that, uh, that it's because of this sort of growing uh, sentiment, either in favor or against, and this sort of uh, internecine struggle in the wine industry, it's an important time as a group, uh, everyone who's here, everyone who supports these kinds of wines, everyone who makes them, everyone who writes about them, it's a good time to step back and reflect on what, uh, what we're doing here, why we're here, what the mission is, uh, if there is a mission, and in general to understand uh, the relationship of these wines, these wineries, this philosophy to uh, the larger world of wine. So um, I've gathered together today a panel of the most sort of opinionated, loudest, funniest, um, uh, most 
offensive people that I know. Hey. <laughs> and um, and so they all represent a different segment of the industry. So that we're going to get a big perspective about uh, how wines of Bowen, so-called, and whatever that means, uh, are sort of looked upon in the uh, in the larger world as a whole. So uh, on the far, my far left, you're right over here, I have Sarah Floyd, um, my dear friend. She is a, 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 a master sommelier. She's, uh, she's a powerhouse in the wine world, um, especially here in the Bay Area. She uh, is a co-owner of Swirl, which is a really great wine broker, carries a lot of huge names in the wine world. She spent uh, a long time as national sales director for Jorge Ordonez, selling giant Tempranillo wines all around the country. That's why well, they're very balanced. They <laughs> are balanced. <laughs> they're balanced in their own way. Um, and then she also <laughs> makes wine now from, uh, from the Santa Lucia Highlands called Louis, a Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Uh, Sarah is never short on something to say, so I'm uh, very excited to uh, start the discussion with you. But first then, I'll say we've got Jim Knight here uh, next to Sarah. Jim is co-owner of the Wine House in Los Angeles, one of the most important wine shops down there, and uh, a huge market. Jim oversees retail uh, aspects of the store as well as the import portfolio. Just but, a cashier, and he's just a cashier. A mean bongo drummer. But also, Jim uh, Jim makes makes wine and has made wine for uh, quite a while on the Central Coast. Jelly Roll, um, which his own has seen its own stylistic evolutions over the years. So uh, I think you can talk about this subject on multiple perspectives. Uh, then over here on my right, we have what might be called in her suit of balance. <laughs> <laughs> I got a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Clendenin uh, needs hardly any introduction, but uh, is he the mind behind Au Bon Climat? Uh, certainly one of the great winemakers California's ever produced and a true warrior and an advocate uh, around the world for his wines, for California wines, for wine in general. Uh, always great to have him. Um, and, uh, and then uh, David Lynch, writer, sommelier, restaurateur now at the great mission spot, St. Vincent. He wrote the book on Italian wine, literally, um, and moved to California in 2009. And I can't remember why exactly. You. My wife wanted to. Oh, it's wife wanted. <laughs> um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, David is an amazing uh, and thoughtful observer of the wine industry as well as a taster and a wine buyer and seller. And so, uh, your um, uh, input on this will be greatly appreciated. Thanks. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and lastly, so one thing that we did, because you can't really just have a panel without tasting wines, we asked everyone on here to select uh, California Pinot Noir that they thought was in some ways interesting, indicative, classic, iconic, or otherwise worth tasting together as a group. So we don't really have a program for tasting these, except for that just intermittently we'll go through, we'll taste these wines, we'll talk about them and see what that brings up. Uh, but I'd like to kick off the discussion first with Jim, and then Jim, we're also going to taste your wines first. Um, but I just want to ask you, sort of back in the, uh, this Jim, yeah, sorry, Jim Clendenin. Um, Jimmy C. That's Jimmy C. Jimmy C. The, sorry, Jimmy K. Yeah. <laughs> um, sort of before In Pursuit of Balance was even formed as a group, you were out there flogging your balanced pinos all around the country and around the world, and in time where these kinds of wines were not in favor, and or at least with sort of the mainstream. And I was just wanted to get you to talk a little bit about what that was like, sort of being in that kind of minority. Well, thanks, Jordan. That's a, that's a pretty uh, broad and encompassing uh, two-decade <laughs> struggle that, that I had, but we can't forget sort of the genesis of that. Back in uh, 1989 and 90, Adam Tomac and I had a very small, very insignificant company that wasn't quite eight years old, and um, Robert Parker, in his infinite wisdom, chose to put it on the top ten most interesting wineries in the world, next to Antonori, Altari, um, Calera. There, there were some, uh, you know, relatively iconic names that were uh, were on that list, and so he took the time to understand what we were trying to do. Apparently, 
and uh, anointed us, and, and he gave me kind of the ultimate get out of jail free card. Something happened shortly there afterwards, and I'm not 100% sure what it was. Uh, I remember being on a panel with Mr. Parker in Oregon at the, uh, uh, the, the original World Pinot Noir celebration that we did, the international celebration of Pinot, starting in the, in the late 80s, and uh, his motives were, were, were pure. His palate was clear, the ideas of what he liked, uh, I think were, were pretty accurate. And um, how things kind of got to where um, wines got bigger, darker, heavier, maybe less typically Pinot Noir. Um, people that made wine that was typically Pinot Noir, at least in my mind, was still typically Pinot Noir, uh, became marginalized in the early 90s. And uh, I was doing a lot of replanting at the time, so it could have been a venue problem. I could have had two young vines. I don't really know, but somehow we went from uh, top 10 most interesting winemakers in the world for a few years to nobody at a Bon Climat cares anymore. And that's just not true, because I have employees that care. At least. <laughs> <laughs> I um, wanted to touch on a couple of things, and I'm not going to belabor really fast uh, over this period of time, but uh, uh, we, we've had a couple of uh, really interesting things that have happened besides the formation of IPOB. Uh, the Sideways Dilemma, which I think was very, very interesting because the motion picture did not popularize a great variety that previously had no or very little popularity at all, even in Santa Barbara County. We totally believe in Pinot Noir. Uh, we had five, under 5% five of the grapes that were planted were actually Pinot Noir at the time that Sideways was uh, uh, released on the world. And I think there are a lot of people that thought Pinot Noir tasted mean, green, lean, and unattractive. I think they liked their soggy, saggy, uh, voluptuous Merlots. They liked the big red wines that they were drinking. And so uh, uh, they didn't really know what to do with uh, these, these wines that were appearing with regularity on people's tables. And you know, we're only talking 05 then. And so I really think that between 95 and 05 in that period of time, there was a movement towards being Pinot Noir a little bit more accessible to people that didn't actually like Pinot Noir. And in fact, I think some of the critics that were judging Pinot Noir didn't really actually like Pinot Noir. And, uh, and so there was a dilemma there that we got a lot of attention. I think maybe some of us were ready for our, uh, our close-up, but uh, a lot of that attention was a little bit um, awkward. And the other uh, uh, two points that I want to touch on really, really quickly, um, John Bonet brought up the, uh, the first panel that, uh, that we were on when uh, Randy Caparoso, and Randy's just a great guy. I go back with Randy forever. When we were young, I could never tell whether he'd been lapped by the field twice or he was ahead of the curve. You know, Randy's just that kind of guy. He, uh, uh, he comes up with ideas you don't know where they come from. So we were making a passionate presentation about bringing balance back to Pinot Noir. It is a funny and unfortunate name, but um, at that time I think it was really an important issue to address. And Randy said, it's got nothing to do with balance. Pinot Noir is all about site, specificity, and quality. You have to have a great vineyard. You have to make great wine. This balance is bullshit. Well, it reminded me when I started making Pinot Noir, nobody wanted to make a good glass of Pinot Noir. And 40 years ago, nobody was making a good glass of Pinot Noir. Every once in a while, you come upon something that was, you know, startling. You know, a 69 Shalom or something from Mount Eden or some uh, wackadoodle bottle. But when you tasted it, didn't speak to you of Pinot Noir, I'm not sure, but it was old and interesting and way better than some of the other craft we were drinking. And uh, I got a little tired of people talking about, you know what I want to do? I want to make Latash. I want to make great, great, great Pinot Noir in America 40 years ago. And I said, how about trying to make a good glass of Pinot Noir? Something that tastes delicious, something that when you drink is wonderful. We're making a lot of great glasses of Pinot Noir right now in a lot of different styles. And I think that's really interesting. But uh, Randy was right. And I have a whole list of things we'll talk about later on, yeah. talking about uh, what we can do to successfully sell balanced Pinot Noir. And it involves really hard work. Yeah. It's just the way it's going to be. Speaking of which, what caused you to choose these two wines to taste as a group? Well, the title was Selling <laughs> Balance. Yeah. And so what I wanted to do is show two wines that I believe speak to some of the success that we've had in international marketing. Where does America have an opportunity to sell wine that is not in America? Okay, Canada, that's easy. Mexico, tax laws, a lot of issues. Japan, resolved the tax laws. Korea, recently resolved the tax laws. I export almost 40% of the wine that I make, and I make a dauntingly large amount of wine. And uh, so I brought these two wines up to show two wines that have amazing export success. Um, I don't really believe anymore, even though I make a couple of them, I don't believe in the paradigm of young vineyards, as John mentioned, young vineyards with interesting clonal selections, a lot of expense in their winemaking, single site, single vintage 
wines at very high prices because your ability to sell a lot of those and make them internationally relevant is very difficult. So I make the largest amount of expensive Pinot Noir that I make. The uh, Isabel wine named after, after my daughter we have there is a 50 buck bottle of Pinot Noir. It sells out faster than anything except my cheapest Pinot Noir. I make a good slug of it for the world. I sell 50% of that wine in Japan, which is really interesting where it's become sort of uh, a wine of the light of its own. But right next to it, I have a wine that has no new oak, that I planted at a time when I was convinced, as I say in my, when I started the business, I couldn't get a grower to sacrifice and grow me good enough Pinot Noir that I could make exciting wine with it. So I decided I had to plant my own vineyards. Then I decided I would crush my own spirit by schizophrenically planting vineyards that were so impossible to set crops in, to ripen fruit in, to make them commercially viable, that every, way, every morning when I woke up and shaved myself, I said, why the fuck did you do this to me? <laughs> and now, I found myself in a position where I couldn't get growers to actually produce enough fruit in the sites that they were planting to allow us to make wines we could afford to make that are delicious and that are, uh, that are commercially viable. So the second one I'm showing you is a project that I started just five years ago. I planted some very productive clones on more productive rootstocks. After getting so invigorating, I invigorated my vineyards out of the commercial vineyard business. And uh, it was a painful thing to realize in the first generation, but this wine is made currently from young fruit, no new oak, and I think it's a pretty delicious Pinot Noir, and its price point's about 25 bucks. I export a lot of it. And there are just two wines that I wanted to show. You know, I, I was told by Jack and I could actually bring up somebody else's wine and rubbish it, and I was tempted. But if I'm gonna rubbish anything, I'm gonna rubbish my own stupidity before I get to yours. Okay, thanks so much, Jim. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> feel free to uh, taste those wines, enjoy them. Maybe there'll be a time, probably not, to uh, ask any questions about them later. I'm gonna toss the conversation now down to Sarah Floyd. Uh, because Jim talked about making quantities of wine, he talked about making wine at affordable price points, um, and but still within his mode, within his brand. Sarah has uh, sold a lot of that wine. She works with a lot of big restaurants, retailers. But Sarah does does in pursuit of balance. Does the notion of balanced Pinot or of a different style does that matter at all? Well, um, you know. It, it's a hard in front of this group, but my joke uh, is I'm always in pursuit of flavor. I'm in pursuit of pleasure. And I'm all about balance, but I definitely don't want to lose uh, those two important factors in when I'm drinking wine. And, you know, with this, there's a lot of amazing wineries here today. Um, and there are a lot of amazing wineries that aren't here today. And I think that's, you know, and it's not a club or an organization. Um, it's just this is the selected group or the people who decided to participate in this event that are here today. But the wine that I chose um, is the Tally Vineyards Estate 2004 Pinot Noir. I don't represent Tally. Brian and his family are dear friends of mine. And I first met him when I worked for Larry Stone. I was 25 years old. I was a wine runner. So I wasn't an assistant. I wasn't assistant sommelier. I just ran bottles to Larry Stone. It was great. I was never thinner in my life. Um, this, go back to it. Up and down, Yubicon, three floors. And um, I wanted to go down the Central Coast, and I was just a minion, and um, I called Jim Clendenin and said, Sarah, I'd love to, but I'm out of town. I called Jim Edelman. Jim Edelman said, it's my twin's birthday, but for you, because you're Larry Stone's minion, um, you can come see us. And I said, I don't want to take away from your child's birthday party. And he said, you know, why don't you visit the Tallies? They make really great wine. Um, Brian and Johnny are fabulous people, and I said, great. So I called them up, and they said, sure, come down. I walked in the winery, from, you know, this is just like the passion of learning about wine, and the winemaker at the time, Steve Rasmussen, um, happened to grow up in a little part of uh, northern Berkeley called Kensington, and within three minutes, we figured out we had the same second grade teacher, and he lived a two-minute walk from my house, and we just really, like, you know, kind of clicked, and, um, Brian came down and I just met him and he said, where are you staying? I said, I don't know, I'm staying at the coast, I haven't figured it out, I'm driving to LA. He said, why don't you stay with me and my wife? And you can uh, spend the night with us and we'll go to dinner. And I was like, wow, these people are great. So um, during that time, you know, I, he said, what would you like to taste? And I did the barrel tasting. I said, I'd like to see wines that don't have malolactic, which was kind of the, the style the, in the, 80s and then in the early 90s, the chart started changing to doing malolactic. 
And so Brian put together this amazing tasting with different vertical vintages of things that were non-ML, partially ML, and full ML. And here I am, this 25-year-old woman learning about wine. And these people spent not just a, two hours, but like 36 <coughs> hours with me. And I think it was one of the, we started a lifelong friendship, um, I consider them like family, but also one of the things that I've always been proud of them is that they've always stuck to making balanced wines. Even when the trend was to make super extracted, um, heavy duty, high alcohol wines, Brian and his team have always stuck to making beautiful wines. And I know that Jim can attest, everybody who has known Brian for, since he's been in the business knows that he's never changed his style. And that's the problem I have with people out of balance because they flip flop. Whatever is the vogue of the day, okay, I'm gonna make 16% highly extracted, you know, old soap for billions of days. And, and then you have people, as soon as that style becomes out of fashion, they go to the other style. I like people like Jim Clendenin, Brian Kelly, who stick to their vision, do what they do because they know it's right. And um, that's why I'm very proud of this one. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I'm gonna throw this down to David Lynch really quick. David. Um, Hi, George. Hi, nice to see you. Great to see you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, Sarah was talking about flip-flopping styles, and you know, um, there's lots of people, and that's that's happened very much in California. Uh, you've witnessed it. You've witnessed it in Italian wines as well. Do you feel like, in general, it's people, it's following the market that that's what they're doing, or do you think it's less cynical than that, and they just don't necessarily, they haven't found their style yet, and they're trying things out. It's tempting to think it's cynical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is a business after all, in, in the same way that I put fried chicken on the menu because of a certain person who writes about restaurants who really likes fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my name. <laughs> By the way, I'm wearing his headpiece, and there's like kind of a sulfuric acid burn going on. <laughs> <you know>, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> Speaking as a sommelier who works the floor every night, <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's kind of a combination because I look at like the modern versus traditional debate in Italy, for example, in Piedmont with Barolo, which to me isn't really a debate or even really a discussion anymore because everyone's kind of finding their road and most of the time that road is somewhere down the middle. And similarly, um, an even younger wine culture in California finding its voice um, through experimentation. And yeah, I mean, of course, I, I, if I were making wine, I would be thinking about what the audience was saying about it and, and where the tides of that, you know, we all, particularly some of us, are especially um, governed or, 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 or influenced, I should say, by the tides of fashion. Uh, let's be honest with ourselves, and there are certain wines that one might put on a list that are more a response to fashion than a response to your visceral reaction as a sommelier uh, to that wine. However, I do think that um, what I've seen is that this, whatever you want to call it, I guess people are very um, reluctant to call this, this isn't a movement, right? We can't say movement. Right. All right. We can't say it's an club. organization. It's not a club. It's not an organization. You can't say click. It's a. It's an. It's an idea. It's, it's a an idea. cloud. But whatever it is, <laughs> it's had good success in catching on because, again, as a sommelier working the floor, <laughs> I can tell you that the the message is getting through to consumers, and I'm noticing by virtue of. Whether it is the so-called natural wine movement or the balance movement, whatever movement you want to attach yourself to, what's happening is that we are consciously shifting our preferences towards wines that are more about finesse and nerve and less about power. And from a restaurant perspective, it's fabulous because we want stuff that we can pair with our food. And more often than not now, the choice of a wine by a customer in a restaurant is driven more by what they think they're gonna enjoy with their meal, uh, as opposed to what the spectator or Parker rating was on it, whatever you wanna call it. 
is not some sort of other measure outside of what this meal and the enjoyment of this meal requires. That to me is a huge forward step that I didn't really recognize when I was first doing this work, but I see it now. I think that doesn't answer the question at all. I think that it's, all, it's definitely the case for the Bay Area, but when you go to other parts of the United States, uh, they still want power. Um, they still, they don't want, um, they're not as interested as the pairing as they are here. I mean, this is a really, really special microclimate of knowledge. Yeah, Jim and I. I think, I think you have to realize, too, is that we as Americans, we grew up on Coca-Cola and low-fat milk, or at least I did. So when I'm I got, Kensington, over Vermont. So when, when, I, when I got into the <laughs> wine business, Coca-Cola and low-fat milk, that's big, rich, concentrated kind of drinks. And I wanted, you know, odds of Shiraz, I wanted extracted Pinot. I hate to admit it. Well, you like to party. But yeah, because <laughs> I wanted gin and tonics. No, but uh, um, <laughs> no, but it's, uh, <laughs> like, we kind of, like, the American palate grows up on rich foods, rich drinks. So when you get into wine, I think the first thing that people go to, at least with my clientele in Los Angeles, they want pretty extracted wines. You know, so for me, it, it, you know, it's, you San Franciscans are great because you're more adventurous than us Los Angeleans. And so, I mean, in Los Angeles, people drink what their lawyer says to drink or what, <laughs> what an actor says to drink. So um, they, want, they want lush, extracted, big, rich, you know, Pinots, Cabs, uh, Syrahs. So this, this, you know, this fight or this, um, this in pursuit of balance is a little more trickier in the, in the market than you know, it, you know, than we talk about as far as, you know, I'd say maybe twenty percent of my clientele is willing to, to go to go this way with these wines. And I, I chose Ghost Rider and Folk Machine wines and I'm a huge fan of Kenny who's way in the back and he's actually on in the audience tonight, but he makes amazing wines, his palette is fantastic and you know it's very balanced Pinot Noir is both with Ghost Rider and Folk Machine. You guys can't see the label, but he's also, you know, he has his friends do the artwork for the label on the folk machine, and it's, you know, killer labels too. And, um, so Jim, he's a uh, badass skater as well. So, <laughs> so Jim, uh, so the uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> so, so, so you just you were just saying that that IPOB wines or the wines at this tasting don't really move the needle. At, uh, at your store, not not as fast as I, I'd like to. I, I mean, there's, I mean, just the, the demographics a lot smaller for me right. in Los Angeles, um, but also being you know selling you know across the nation as well. You know, we do a lot of online business. I think you know just kind of the wine geeks get this mm -hmm. and they understand it, but still, and this is not. To, I'll mention the vineyard, but the Sony vineyards. That's kind of more the style that. Yeah, Pisani, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pisani is totally balanced. It's balanced in a different way, and the growing conditions are different than Mendocino, Sonoma Coast. I didn't mean that. Yeah, you know. Do you want to go? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I'll punch you for this one. Okay, but but Pisani is a little more extractive. You can't over. use them, but, but the problem is, it's not. It's what their their climate gives them because it's, they have been paying on the vine for a long time because it doesn't get hot there, and so they get very physiologically right. If you taste Pizzoni, uh, all the wines made, Peter Michael, um, you know, I mean, there's winemaker differential, Roar, you'll see there's balance. It's, I mean, it's, it's not just, like they're sweet, just, syrupy it's things. Opinion. It's not overly alcohol. That's the problem. It's, it's but, uh, uh, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be kind of a gentleman in the audience yeah. with a sommelier t-shirt. We must acknowledge him. <laughs>
personally, someone they who makes a $24 them. peanut, yes, but I didn't put mine in the panel. And, and, and the bulk machine is, uh, SRP is about 24 bucks as well. So I mean, that, that falls somewhere between 22 and 24. But I, I think, I, I, for me, the hard part, you know, the hard part, not for me personally, but for my consumers, they, they, look, at, they look at color equals flavor more. So, so they want to see, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, cold maceration, extended maceration, whatever it is, you know, or, or enzymes, you know, color X, what do they mean? Or mega purple. You know, yeah, they, like, so they, they look and see this wine and go, um, like, at dinner I was with some customers and I ordered glitter eye off, of, off, this was just, you know, two nights ago, and they saw the color, they go, oh my God, that's so light. They go, yeah, it just tasted it though. You know, so people look at color and they think that, you know, if it's, if it's a light color, they think, oh my God, it's not as flavorful. That is, that's a general statement for a general consumer. And that's, those are people that, that I deal with. I mean, the people in this room, I mean, you guys are all very knowledgeable about wines. It's not towards you and you guys know how to sell that. I, it's, you know, it's, it's just, you have to, you know, for me, it's, I can't just hand them a bottle of, you know, folk machine uh, Pinot. I have to give them a story. I got to, you know, talk about. It. It's not an easy sell. There's sure. a lot more sure. work, and I, that, that's what we're okay. in business for. Right. So. Well, and speaking of not easy sells, that's sort of where we started off, Jim Clendenin, that you spend 20 years or more. Do you think um, making not easy sells to want to people who didn't necessarily want this style of wine um, would it have been easier in back then if there had been a group like in pursuit of balance which is sort of the a, a leading a, a fringe a uh, you know a sort of an, a, a, absolutely yeah. you know when, uh, when I started if you went into a great wine list oriented restaurant in Los Angeles there were three Pinot Noirs on there 50 Merlots 125 Cabernet uh, in San Francisco now, if you go in, there might be more Pinot Noir and Burgundy than there is Cabernet or, uh, or Merlot and Zinfandel all, uh, all together. And those opportunities are opportunities that we have to work with. Um, we find interesting and interested sommeliers and, uh, and wine buyers, uh, they, they can have wines that uh, are balanced one way for a different customer. They can have wines that are balanced in, in, the, uh, in the way that, uh, that we have. I mean, when you taste my Pinot Noir, when you taste Gary Pizzoni's in the water, you can recognize that Gary and I have one thing in common. We were both born in 1953. And that was it. Okay, bad hair line. Bad hair line. <laughs> but Gary has a different idea of balance, a different idea of style. Oh, and he has customers all over the world that are, are, that, are, that are begging to be able to buy those wines. I don't take that away from anyone. I don't like recipe winemakers. I don't like formulas that involve water adulteration and uh, acidity year in and year out, whether it's needed cold climate or warm climate. That, that kind of winemaking is not winemaking to me. It, it's absent soul and absent passion. And, and so I don't like that. You know, if somebody tells me that their most important decision, and I had this told to me by a very famous American funeral you know, winemaker, the most important decision that we have to get with accuracy is how many of the raisins that we have in our fermentation are going to soak up to what alcohol. Because if we don't know that right away, we can't add enough water to compensate for that. And you know, I think there were better decisions to make, like choosing your site carefully setting whether you're going to have refrigerated rootstock or, uh, or, or vigorous rootstock. I think that um, farming techniques, we were talking about leaf pulling, you know, uh, in a year like 2014, it was very important to know that it was going to be a very hot year and not to leaf pull down in our neighborhood. It was interesting hearing what uh, Aaron and, and Ross had to say. We, we clearly go or only five and six hours apart, but we have totally different, uh, totally different climates. There's no question. The pen, in, in our case, was a year that was very important to get the grapes off quickly before we had people lose their job in uh, 2010 because they waited through the heat spell and they got 30 brick fruit and uh, didn't know when to pick. Did they think the morning dew was going to bring it back from 30 bricks down to 24 bricks? That's not going to happen. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's not irrigation, you know, <laughs> not, um, not going to happen. But I think, I think we're in a position now, uh, irrespective of what Jim says, on a positive note, uh, I say to all the people that make Grenache in the world, all Grenache has to do is become popular five days of the year in China. I mean, you'll sell everything you make. You know, I keep thinking about that with my Tokai Friolano project. Yeah. I am convinced I'm going to be out before I even know it. But with Pinot Noir, we have a lot of opportunities. And we don't make that much Pinot Noir, certainly compared to how much Cabernet Sauvignon is made in, in the U.S. Uh, there is less Pinot Noir. And to answer Jordan's question accurately, yes, 
If we would have had 15 years ago in pursuit of balance with the level of passion, commitment, and dedication of all the producers in the room right now that are going to be sharing their wines afterwards, um, I can tell you how fast it happened in New York. Uh, Jasmine put together something that was so incredibly compelling that three years ago or two years ago, the first time we did it, there were maybe 200 people that kind of wandered through and that was on their way to a different tasting. Nobody was passionate about their committed. Every sommelier of merit, every person that was on the street carrying a bag, there were all there, 600 people, professionals, in the three hour tasting uh, at IPO. Please don't forget the retailers, Jim. Hmm? There's retailers, too. I mean, there's so many, so many, so many. So many. Yeah. Yeah, no, we had retailers, retailers, yeah, retailers, 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 <laughs> but, uh, but we had professionals more than we had amateurs coming in afterwards to drink, and that all happened just in a couple of years, and I believe that's the power of the organization. I think yeah. the organization gets the word out better than even one slightly uh, diminished, mentally, but very, very, very active, verbally guy could do over 15 years by myself. Yeah. Um, no, I, that's a great point. And um, I want to throw it back to David Lynch down there. Uh, David, I thought what you said about what you're experiencing in your restaurant, maybe it is sort of a Bay Area, San Francisco bubble, but yet um, compared to what Sarah and Jim experience elsewhere in the country. But to me, that's still an important thing to take into account, that this could be a, the, the leading edge of, of what people are looking for. And usually San Francisco and New York are sort of in advance of larger tides of culture that um, crash on the country. Do you, given that you've worked so much in New York and San Francisco, this change seems real, and how would you say, you know, what to do in these other markets where people are still, you know, fighting the old fight? Most of the producers in this room don't make enough wine to worry about anyone other than the coastal elites anyway, so I don't see why you would. <laughs> So just focus on those markets, and you know, if you happen to place something in Oklahoma, then you know, right on, good work. Yeah. Uh, but go uh, Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how. To, Could you talk also I, about uh, why you chose here? Uh, yes, flowers. I will. Because I was very uh, before I got into the restaurant business, I was in the magazine business. So I went from one unlucrative career to another. And, uh, in doing so, when I was when I worked at Wine and Spirits magazine, Josh Green wrote a piece about flowers that was uh, pretty. I, I think at the time, for for us anyway, as a magazine, and I think at the time, kind of paradigm shifting in terms of casting a light on that area and on what they were doing. And so I picked them because they were kind of like the OG, well, one of the OGs, obviously not the OG, but one of the OGs out there. And for some of you older folks, OG means original gangster, <laughs> like sort of like one of those. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have no, clue. no, you're welcome. You're welcome. I, I want to make this inclusive. I want to make this inclusive. Um, and so I, 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 I'm a big, I, I really, um, one of the things that I've embraced being out here is uh, what I would call the heritage brands of California. Uh, the Mount Edens, the Old Long Climats, the Ridges, things like that, where, where there's an incredible amount of history Yes. And then I also, of course, I, I, the upstarts uh, as well are fascinating and inspiring to me as well because they're people that are really uh, living their passions uh, in, in a real way and, and not, not for the pursuit of money, that's for sure. And um, the, the dichotomy right now in this in sort of melding of, and in fact even on this table of sort of heritage brands versus more sort of upstart, almost garagiste level kind of brands is, is really interesting to me. And what I think that it's incumbent on me and everyone like me to sort of start to break the yoke of French, of, of, of seeing everything through this sort of Burgundian, if we're talking about Pinot Noir, this Burgundian prism. I'm guilty of it. Uh, the vast majority of uh, sommeliers are guilty of it, where we're now kind of entering, I kind of feel, uh, and I'm excited about it, uh, an era where we don't have to talk about things through some sort of Burgundian prism, but in fact, we're starting to clearly delineate some of these regions of Pinot Noir that we see on the table here. And it gives us something to say in a restaurant that we maybe didn't have the ability to say in the past, and sort of talk about regional differences in California wines in and of themselves, as opposed to part of some, part of some other thing of how well they fit into a, quote, Burgundian model. I was on a panel 
last year in Portland. Uh, and everything, the whole conversation with Burgundian this and Burgundian that, at one point, one of the Oregon winemakers was like, why, why are we having this conversation right now? Why are we talking about Oregonian and not Burgundian? And similarly, I think we finally arrived at a place, as evidenced by the number of people in this room have, listening to this borderline discussion here, uh, that we're kind of out of place now where we can say, well, you know, Mendocino gives you this, Sonoma Coast gives you this, and Santa Barbara gives you this. And you can actually uh, uh, show that in a glass to a customer and they can understand it. Um, and I don't know that those delineations were as clear years ago. I could be wrong. Um, I don't have as much experience with it. No, I, I, mean, I absolutely agree. And I think what's great about the Bay Area announcement is that people are super into trying new things. Um, you know, in certain places, and I don't like to get into shoot my foot, but go that go they want the rum bower. And they, it's like a flavor, like ranch dressing. They don't want, like, they're not like, oh, I want, the, oh, I'll try a little vinegar or something like that. They want the flavor they know. And thankfully, I mean, I'm a seventh generation Bay Area, so I'm proud to say that um, it's a really, like, I travel all over the country selling wine, and this is the area that's the hardest because people are the most knowledgeable, I mean, as a whole. Um, and it's also, they know the areas really well, so you can't, like, BS them and tell them, like, oh, it's over on this road, because they'll be like, uh-uh, I was on that road, and there wasn't that vineyard. So you really have to be, um, when you're presenting wines, you have to really be very specific and very accurate. But people are very, um, they want new things. A lot of people in life don't want new. They like what they like, and they don't want to try something else. But in Bay I see this very wonderful, uh, especially with younger people, just excited to try something new. And uh, all the baby Einstein must have done well with yeah. that. So it's like, it really gives us a nice uh, place to show new wines. And it's a great place to have a business where you sell small producers because we are fighting the Goliaths. We're not. We get to have uh, yeah. a lot of attention here. Um, I just wanted to. <clears throat> I think that's that's really well said, and um, and you know I think as you also said, Jim Clinton, and that just you know the criticisms of IPOB, withstanding um, that just the fact that it's as a group it's more powerful to make a statement, whether that statement is as relative now as it was five years ago, or relevant, sorry, as it was five years ago. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter because it's important always if you have something to say to keep saying it. Um, I wanted to just mention the wine that I chose because uh, that which was the Pay uh, Savoy Vineyard. Um, <coughs> and, Super good. Yeah, yeah. and Super good. When, uh, when we sort of were thinking up this panel and thought, what are we going to taste? And we just thought, all right, wines that you think sort of quintessentially uh, describe California or its potential. You know, I didn't think uh, first of a producer, I, I ended up thinking of the Savoy Vineyard, and whether it's a wine made by Andy and Nick Hay and Vanessa, who are, uh, Andy and Nick are there, wearing similar shirts, and, um, or whether Ted, uh, Ted Lemon, that when, uh, when I taste Pinot from the Savoy Vineyard, oftentimes I just get this really joyous sense of beautiful, bright, rich California fruit, it's sumptuous, it's balanced, it's round, it's big, it's sort of unapologetically happy to me, that kind of wine, and I, and I love it. And so I just wanted to sort of, as, uh, as John Bonet mentioned in, in his talk about, and Sarah even, about searching out flavor and also searching out the sites. Like to me, Savoy Vineyard is one of those places that in California delivers flavor time and time again, no matter who's producing it. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, with all these producers, Jim with your vineyards, um, Sarah with your Pizzoni, whatever it is, like seeking out these uh, sites and discovering the styles that they handle best. And I think that's the most important thing. Don't put the circle in the square. I mean, if it's not gonna work, I mean, if Pizzoni's tried to make 12% uh, alcohol Pinot Noir, it would taste like shit. I mean, it's just, they're given what their vineyard does, um, you know, everyone talks about Gary. Gary is like the mascot of the family. The real people behind it are Mark Pizzoni, who has a master's degree in ag economics and viticulture, and Jeff Pizzoni, the winemaker, who has also a degree from uh, Fresno State in winemaking. And these are people, as my business partners, as people I've represented, and I hate to bring it because they're not here, but I just, because there's a little 
kind of stigmatism going in. Um, there are people that are really, really passionate about what they do. They're very meticulous and they're very respected. So it's not like, oh, Fazoni is just trying to be this like party animal wine. Um, there's a reason why it's made the way it's made. And I like one thing about them is they've never changed. They keep on doing it the way they know their vineyard works best. And if you work with any winemaker that buys fruit from them, they'll say that Mark is the most meticulous grape grower they work with. So, or one of them, and okay. winemaker. So. Great, thank you for saying that. Um, We've just got a few minutes left, and uh, I'm not exactly going to turn it over to Jim Clendenin for a rant. Um, <laughs> oh, right. oh, right. <laughs> um, but he does have something he did want to say uh, with regard to this topic. I'd also like to invite other panel members, if you feel the need to get in and interrupt Jim, um, <laughs> jump in. And it's just kind of a free-for-all here. This, this is kind of mostly for uh, <laughs> producers, <laughs> uh, growers, makers in the room, but uh, uh, that there is something that, that's kind of an undercurrent in, in the wine business right now that's very relevant to what Dave was talking about, about the Burgundianizing the, uh, the nature of selling Pinot Noir in the world. The, um, the last five harvests in Burgundy have been very, very difficult. Uh, it's been very painful for them to confront the amount of wine they had to sell for the world at a time when the interest in what they're doing has become more and more and more prominent. Uh, and, and what that has done for me as I console myself with a glass of burgundy when I'm in France and try to talk about the vicissitudes of nature um, is it's allowed places like the UK that buys a whole lot of burgundy, like New York City that buys a whole lot of burgundy, to have to turn their attention elsewhere to try to find things. Once again, the elite coasts, no question. Uh, but if they want to buy a uh, $100 plus or minus bottle of wine off of a list that's a premium crude burgundy, there's so little available to buy at any price all getting it at a price that was reasonable a couple of years ago that um, my sales in the, in the UK in the last two years have gone up 400% my sales in New York City have gone from struggling to do a quarter of a million dollars to four times that recently just because of availability in the marketplace um, we built other markets at the same time and we added things up um, not including New York as an export market though I personally think it's an export market for me um, we, we were, uh, as, as I said earlier, 38% export. And why? Because the flavors that we have in our wines are flavors that are comfortable to consumers that come from wine cultures that have nothing to do with the US. I am never going to reach out to a guy who's willing to pay $250 for a bottle of fruit-driven Cabernet from the Valley. Unimaginable, a fruit bomb of 250 bucks a bottle made out of Cabernet. That's really weird. I might rather buy a $9 Merlot from Panamalia. That's kind of where my price points are for these kinds of things. But I am going to be able to reach out to somebody who likes the style of wine that we happen to make and can't find it anyplace else at a comparable price. And it's been a real eye-opening thing for me. In the beginning, I couldn't understand it. I, I thought I just had really good salespeople in New York City. Instead, the reality was supply and demand, very simply. And we don't make enough wine in the entire in pursuit of balance group to uh, worry about uh, having to go out and, and thrash the marketplace, unless we do something insensitive at pricing or making the wine available. If we, if we make the wine available, and if we have some kind of comprehensive idea of choosing our site carefully, um, why make life so hard? Why plant in places where you can't grow and ripen grapes? They're doing it all over the Santa Rita Hills now. Uh, maybe they should visit a place like Burgundy a few times. Understand when you get to the top where it's windswept and barren, nothing grows there. You can't grow row crops there, you can't grow grapes there, and you certainly can't make, make any money. You better find yourself a protected little swale and, and plant that, and I think that's a good idea. Plant carefully. We've got a lot of research in rootstock and cones, and you can use it. Farm intelligently, market carefully, price sensibly. These are not really, really, really hard things, but, but I bet if anybody shows you a business plan right now um, about developing a vineyard in Santa Barbara County or in the Sonoma Coast or in Mendocino, nobody has any of those ideas anywhere in that business plan. Kind of wacky, huh? All right, thank you. Very well said, and I think actually it was a great summation. Um, you know, the Burgundian word notwithstanding, you're absolutely right that the world needs more Pinot of a certain character, of balance that delivers fresh flavors, good acidity, and um, whether or not that's still people asking for powerhouse wines uh, all, all around, that demand will be growing, no matter. Flavorful wines. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things, that we have a problem with, and this is why he picked this panel, is because I'm all for balance. I, 
hope I, I live my life buying wines that I think are balanced and selling wines I think are balanced. But there are wines that are trying to fit this mold that don't have flavor and that taste like water. And I, I just feel like there's a movement that's important, but there's also, you have to understand what it is that balance is versus low alcohol. And low alcohol isn't just the, the gateway into balanced wine. And I think that's an important part that, you know, I have a problem with is that people are making wines that don't have any flavor. And I'm like, just drink vodka, sure. man. It's yeah. like lower calories you can, and you, can you get a job done faster. The, you can follow the trend to the super right. Or you can follow the trend to the end of the world. Most people are making low alcohol. No, low one alcohol shot. Wines they can, <laughs> you know? So most people are making low alcohol wines because they can. You know, it's not like a. It's like, oh my god, I got to kiss now because I, I got to get you know under thirteen percent alcohol or under fourteen. That's not. You know, I don't think anybody here is actually trying to do that. So I mean, it's, you know, these these wineries and these winemakers are forcing to do that. I think like Mazzoni, they're not. You know. So that you know, they can't they can't pick earlier to make low alcohol wines. You know, otherwise the phenolic brightness wouldn't be there. So it tastes like bitter. So. Uh, do you remember? I mean, Monterey County Cabernet. When I used to blind taste to study for the MS, it's like what tastes like a green bell pepper. Oh, Monterey Cabernet. I mean. Those are what that area gives you. It's cool climate. It doesn't get 100 degrees in I September. I mean, question for you guys. You guys are all here. I mean, we're all here because we enjoy these wines. Uh, first and foremost, I'm honored to be on this panel. But, um, but do you guys, you guys sell these wines in your restaurants, your retail stores. You guys are all here because you're into it. Is, it. is it an easy sell for you? You know, I mean, raise your hands if, like, these wines. For instance, who carries folk machine Pinot? In this store, in this uh, audience, are these? E is this an easy wine for you guys to sell? Yeah. It is. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and and I love carrying these wines just for me. You know, in L. A., it just takes a lot more time with the consumer to sell these wines. It's not like you know. It's but that's exactly what Jim Quinton yeah. did for all of his time. His time with the consumer, traveling, circumnavigating the globe multiple times, over and over again. That's what it takes. We were disenfranchised from high high scores. I didn't get my get out of jail free card anymore, so I had to make friends. But, but it wasn't like my company wasn't growing. If you can tell me what business plan I had that said I should go from making 1,600 cases of wine to 70,000 cases of wine, good economy or bad economy, man, I'm just lucky I'm not suicidal. But that's that, I think that's why we're all here. That's why you know Jasmine and Raj put on put on this event is to just get the word out. Is it I think that's the most important thing is for all of us to be able to work a little harder to sell these wines. I mean, you know, the distributors are doing that, whoever you, yeah. know, whoever you decide to, yeah. you know, to go with there. There's a reason why you're with your certain distributor because you know, you're not going to go, these wines, you know, might not be with the Southern wine spirits because you need somebody to hand sell them. Sure. Nothing wrong with Southern in case they're listening. No. <laughs> uh, no so uh, anyway. I think I think uh, I hear the bustling going on. The trade tasting is about to start. There's going to be a lunch for uh, panel attendees, right, or uh, seminar attendees. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ghost Rider and Folk Machine. Uh, I'd like to thank Flowers and Kay and Tally and Ivanka Mark for supplying the lunch. I'd like to thank Phil Phil, Tim Mike, Tim Ben, and David Lynch for making uh, time to be on the panel with me. And thank you all very much for coming and sitting and listening to this, and I'm sure the discussions will continue to rage on after this session. Right? <laughs> Don't forget to drop your glasses. Oh, yeah. Drop your glasses and push in your chairs. Yeah, and dump your glasses. And push in your chairs.